Lord, I pray, Lord, in everything and in every way, Lord, we would want to be, we would want to grow, we would want to mature, we would want to be wiser so that we can be and live the way you call us to, Lord God. Help us, Lord God. Give us that, that thirst, that, that hunger, Lord God, to truly be everything that we can be in you. And so be with us this morning. I thank you as always for getting us here, Lord God. Uh, I know you have something for us wherever we are in your word. You have something for us to learn. And so I pray everyone in here, Lord God, whether they're someone a long time coming or whether they're coming for the first time, that they would know, Lord, this is your house, that we are your people, that by your spirit, Lord, you speak through your word. And so teach us this morning as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning once again. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, let's turn to the book of Revelation chapter 14. Okay? Book of Revelation. If you're visiting, again, you picked a very interesting week to visit uh, because we are in Revelation and it is a very scary, if I can even use that word, passage that we are covering as we have been studying the seven-year tribulation. Okay? The seven-year tribulation, in case you don't know what that is, it is the an event that will take place, the Bible declares it throughout Scripture, where after the church has been raptured up, the church has been taken up out of here. The Bible says, right, Jesus said in Matthew, I'm sorry, in John 14, I go away to prepare prepare a place for you, right? And if I go, I will return to receive you to myself. And the Bible says one day he is indeed returning for his church to get us out of here, to take us or rapture us out of here. And when he does, as we've covered in detail The Antichrist will make his appearance again. Satan will finally be able to do what he's desired to do for seven years. But before we get into that, as we begin this morning, one of the the important things that I encourage everybody in this room, everybody that will listen to this afterwards, that if you are a believer, priority number one is that you need to read through the Bible. Would you agree with that this morning? All of us, again, Priority number one, if you've never read the whole New Testament, number one, goal, start today, finish the New Testament. It's very important, right? The Bible says we need to know the full counsel of God, all of it. Goal number two, after you finish the New Testament, go back and read the Old Testament. Read it all, right? Read it all. It's so, so important from Genesis to Malachi. Read it all. Now, when you do, not only does God speak, because God always speaks to us through his word. But the beautiful thing, and I remember doing this the first time, the first time I read through the Bible, again, I remember coming across scriptures that just blew my mind. You guys with me? You know that feeling where you, God just, wow, it's like you didn't know that was there kind of thing. And one of those times I remember doing this, this was many years ago, but this scripture has always stuck with me. You don't have to turn here, but in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11, Solomon writes this. He said, because... The sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, right away. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Now let me simplify this for you. Solomon said something that we can all relate to, we can all understand, and that's this. Because God does not execute his judgment upon us right after we've sinned, we keep sinning. Because we think we get away with it. Is that true? Can you agree that if God started sending lightning bolts and burning people up every time they sinned, we would learn real quick that we better not sin. Not true. But what? Because we don't see judgment taking place right away, we think we get away with it. Oh, I guess it's all right. I guess God didn't see me. I guess because it was in the dark, God missed it. And people keep sinning. And just look around because we live in a world where people keep sinning. But the Bible tells us over and over and over again that one day God is going to execute his judgment upon the ungodly. And that is from Genesis all the way to Revelation. God declares over and over, God has warned over and over again that the day is coming when that execution, where that judgment will fall. And guess what? God always keeps his word. When God says something, he is 100%. He's not guessing. He's not hoping. What he declares will come to pass. 
Now, we better understand this because we live specifically in a world today that says what? Well, God is too loving. Don't they say that? God is too loving. He's too nice. One day, he's just going to let everyone into heaven. Everyone's going to get, he's just too nice. He's that nice grandfather in the sky. And that's what the world wants to believe. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does teach that God is loving. But the Bible also teaches that God is holy and righteous. And the fact that he is righteous means that because he always does right, he must punish what is wrong. And so no one's going to get away with it. No way, again, it is all going to catch up to us, to us all. The Bible, I mean, not the Bible says, forgive me, it's not in the Bible. What's the old saying? He who dances must one day pay the piper. Don't ask what verse that is, okay? It's not in the Bible. <laughs> but that, that truth is real. That truth is real. And that day is coming soon. When I look around and I see the ugliness of the world and I see how difficult things are, I'm reminded that we're getting close. I mean, how much bad can it get? How much bad can it get? This time when God is finally going to judge the world is coming close. And I think, sadly, for so many people, so many people who didn't want to believe it, they're going to find out that what God said was true all along. And it'll be too late. Now, let me back up. If you've been with us the last several weeks, we covered chapters 12, 13, 12 and 13, specifically these two chapters. And in these two chapters, if you don't know, I've entitled them The War of the Ages. It's kind of the section that I call The War of the Ages. Why? Because in these two chapters, we were introduced in chapter 12 to Satan, the great red dragon. And we read about, again, his desire to be like God. Remember, he wanted to be worshipped like God. And the Bible says in Isaiah 14, he was kicked out of heaven because he wanted what God had. He'd seen again God the Father on the throne and he wanted to be worshipped and he was kicked out of heaven. And in his jealousy and in his hate against God, he was cast down to the earth and he has waged war with God and God's creation ever since. We read that in chapter 12. We read what Satan was up to. But then in chapter 13, we are told what Satan will be up to during this seven-year tribulation. When the church is gone and Satan will finally have full reign, the ability to do what he has always wanted to do. Now, because Satan wants to be like God, Satan will do two things. He will introduce two people to the world. Person number one we read about is known as the Antichrist. Remember, Satan wanted to be like the Father. And so what will he do? He will introduce a fake Jesus, the Antichrist, who will take over the world again. He will be the one world ruler establishing a one world government, ruling the world politically and financially or economically. That day is coming. We've covered this in detail. But then remember, Satan wants to be like God. He has to copy the Trinity. So what does he do? He introduces a false prophet. We call him the fake Holy Spirit. And together, during these seven years, they will deceive the world. They will again lead the world to worship Satan through the Antichrist. Again, we read about the image that will be set up. Again, if you missed it, go back and listen. It's all available for you on YouTube, guys. But it's been amazing as we read about all these details. Now, one of the other things that we learned... As we learned about what Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet will be up to, everyone who follows them will be following them. But here's the, the scariest part. What about all those people who won't follow the Antichrist? You know, I've talked to many people over the years and many people that at one time were serving God. Or maybe they went and they're, and they're backslidden. They, they no longer come to church or maybe they come to church on Christmas and Easter or whatever it is. And I've asked them, when are you going to get right? What are, you, what are you playing Russian roulette with your soul for? What do you want to be left behind? Do you want to find yourself living in the tribulation? And I've had them tell me, it's all right, I'll just get my head chopped off. Like it's going to be that easy. 
Like it's going to be easy to live for God. And I tell them, like I'll tell you right now, if you can't live for God today, how are you going to live for God when the Antichrist is ruling and reigning in this world? It is not going to be that easy. And if you've been with us, we've been reading that he is going to be martyring anyone who does not bow down and worship him. Anyone who does not receive his mark on your right hand or on your forehead. We've covered all this. And he's going to slaughter millions. Millions, guys. You know that Satan has always been after the Jewish people, trying to exterminate the Jewish people from the beginning. Wouldn't you agree with that? The Assyrians, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Germans, the Romans, all through history. This is what we've seen. We know that six million people were killed in the Holocaust. But the Bible says more will be killed, more Jews will be killed during the seven year period. It'll be the worst, even greater than the six million. It'll be a terrible time. But he won't only go after Jews. Anyone anyone. When I think about the church, and especially my heart goes out to younger people that are on the fence, they want to serve God, they know they should, but, but the world is calling them, and so they're halfway in and they're halfway out, and they never surrender, they're going to find themselves living in the tribulation, because they knew better. It's going to be difficult, but they know they can't follow the Antichrist. You know that. They won't be able to. And so you're going to suffer. And again, I know this is dark, but this is what the Bible teaches. And you need to know this. This is why we're warned today. This is why we're warned ahead of time today. Because he will be killing Jews. He will be killing anyone who does not bow down to him. Now, we covered all this in chapter 12 and 13. And I told you last week, if the Bible ended at the end of chapter 13... Man, that would be sad, wouldn't it? It would look as if Satan has won, which is why I thank God for chapter 14, okay? Because chapter 14, if you were with us last week, we covered the first five verses, showed us that Jesus wins in the end. Now, because today is Palm Sunday, remember, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday the first time, everyone received him, didn't they? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, because they believed and they hoped that he was going to establish his kingdom on earth, he was going to overthrow the Roman Empire, and they were going to reign with him. But when they found out that Jesus did not come then to establish his kingdom, what they do? They rejected him, because they did not, or he did not do what they wanted him to do. We understand that the first time Jesus came, he came to establish his spiritual kingdom on earth, not his physical kingdom. But the Bible declares that one day he's coming back to establish his political kingdom on earth. And that's what we read last week. In the first five verses, again, I'm not going to cover them again, we saw Jesus. He is the Lamb. And he's standing on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the ancient name for Jerusalem. And he is returned as the conquering king to establish his kingdom. He is going to reign upon the throne of David with his people. And we've seen Jesus surrounded with the 144,000. Again, very, very beautiful. But what's interesting about last week is it was almost like John was given that reminder that Jesus wins, Satan and his followers lose. But it's almost like if you were reading it, you're like, well, but what happened? It's almost like you skipped a part, God. What happened before that? So to answer that, we get verses 6 through 20. Verses 6 through 20 explain what happened before Jesus is able to establish his political kingdom. He first has to deal with his enemies, doesn't he? And that's what we're going to read about. If you're taking notes, we're going to look at the judgment of the enemies of God, okay? The judgment of the enemies of God. We're going to look at the summary, and the reason it's called the summary is because we get the full details in chapters 16, 17, and 18. But before we get the full details, we're given a, just a summary of how it all ends, how the tribulation will end. And it will end beginning 
with the final warning, okay? With the final warning. If you're not already there, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, John writes, he says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, notice, to every nation and every tribe and every language and and every people, right? This angel is flying overhead. He is preaching an eternal gospel, proclaiming it to everyone left alive on the earth again at the end of the tribulation. Now, when you think about angels, the word angel is the Greek word angelos, and it means messenger. And if you know the Old Testament, you know that God always used angels as messengers. That's their job. That's their role. And so once again, we see God using an angel to uh, preach or proclaim the gospel. Now, someone might ask this question, well, why don't the church preach the gospel? Where's the church at? Church is in heaven. So God uses an angel, and it's an interesting picture here. As John looks in this, to the skies of the earth, and he sees an angel flying. Can you imagine an angel flying directly over you, preaching the eternal gospel? Why is it called the eternal gospel? Well, doesn't it preach the message of eternal life? And so he's preaching. This is interesting. We've always read about the church preaching the gospel. Now we read about an angel who will preach the gospel to those still alive on the earth. Verse 7. He said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Now, again, I don't plan on being here during the the tribulation. I hope you don't either. But that will be pretty incredible to see an angel, right, flying over you, right, flying over La Habra, (laughs) preaching the gospel, right, calling on people. Notice what it says, with a loud voice. Why would he be speaking loud? Is he trying to get people's attention? Fear God. What's he saying? Don't fear Satan. Don't fear the Antichrist. If there's someone you better feel, fear, it's who? You better fear God. You better fear God and give him glory. Now, fear of God is so important. Why? Well, the Bible teaches in Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, when you finally wise up is when you realize you better learn to fear God. That's so beautiful. It's so simple. So many people make bad choices. They make bad mistakes because they don't fear God. We need to fear God. We need to understand he's not a nice grandpa Santa Claus in heaven. He is almighty God. People don't fear him today. They use his name in vain, right? They cuss. They, you know, they mock. They laugh. Oh, Lord, have mercy. We finally wise up when we start fearing God. And this is what we're told to do. This is what the angel, again, is telling those left alive. You better wise up. If there's anyone you better fear, it's God. Keep reading. The angel says, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Along with fearing God, the second thing the angel declares is you better worship God. Don't worship the image of the beast. Remember, that's going to be happening. You better worship God. Why should we worship God? He tells us why. Because he's the creator. Isn't that awesome? Do we understand that we were created to worship him? That's why he made us. We owe that to him as our creator. And anyone who refuses to worship God again... Think about what they're saying to God. You made me, but so what? That's what they're saying. And the angel reminds the world. He made you. Here you are worshiping Satan. Here you are worshiping the Antichrist. Here you are bowing down to this false idol, this false image, when you should be worshiping the one who made you. Wouldn't you agree? We owe that to God. We owe it to God. Without him, do you realize this morning when you woke up, God gave you breath? 
You didn't earn that. God gave it to you. We owe it to him. We owe it to him. Oh, Lord, help us. We should come early to church. Thankful. Grateful. Thank you, God, for another day. Thank you for every blessing. We owe it to him. Now, what I love about this on a quick side note, do you understand that by this statement, this angel blows Charles Darwin out of the water? You guys with me? What did the angel make sense? Make clear. You didn't come from monkeys. Can you imagine the angel with a bullhorn? You didn't come from monkeys. God made you. The theory of evolution is wrong. God is your creator. And you owe it to him. You better worship him. But remember, he's talking with a loud voice. Why is he talking with a loud voice? Well, he told us why. Again, look back at verse 7. Because the hour of his judgment has come. It's the last call. Okay? It's the last call. Not the last call for alcohol. Okay? But it's the last call. This is it. Okay? This is it. He's calling. He's yelling. He's warning. This is it. You've had a bunch of chances already. Has God given the world chances? Oh, Lord, right? Come on. But he says this is it. Why is God so good? Why is God so merciful? Why is God giving them chances even this far into the tribulation? Because God is good. Someone say amen to that, right? The Bible says, 2 Peter 3, 9, that God is not willing that any should perish, but what? That all should come to Repentance. God doesn't want you to go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. God has provided a way through his son that you can go to heaven. And that's what he wants. Anyone, let me tell you, anyone that blames God when they find themselves in hell doesn't know what they're talking about. Because that's not what, remember, hell was created for Satan and his demons. It was never created for mankind. This is what happens when you refuse to take advantage of the mercy and the opportunity that God has given us. The good news today, think about it, is if God is still providing opportunity during the tribulation, what does that tell us? That we have opportunity today to get right. Amen? Someone might say, Pastor, but you don't know what I've done. Pastor, I've backslid in too many times. Pastor, again, I've messed up. As long as there's breath in your lungs, we serve a, a forgiving God, okay? We serve a forgiving God, and we need to praise him for it. We need to be thankful. We need to come to him because time is running out. It is running out. Now, Jesus said something very important. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said this. And what I love is what John saw is a fulfillment of what Jesus said. Matthew 24, 14, it says, And this gospel, remember the eternal one, of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then Jesus says what? And then the end will come. It's all there. It's all there. We have been warned. The world has been warned, Okay. This is what's going to happen. There will be one last can't chance, one last call, one final warning, and then that's it. Verse 8. Another angel, a second one, followed the first angel, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine, drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. After the first angel gave the final warning, a second angel follows him and announces, fallen, fallen, is Babylon, excuse me, the great. The angel proclaims that Babylon has fallen. It's over. Babylon is done with. Now, what's interesting about this is the details of Babylon falling don't happen until Revelation 16, 17, and 18. In other words, at this point in time, it really hasn't fallen yet. But the angel is speaking prophetically that it is going to fall. And the angel is so certain that it's going to fall that he speaks of it already happening. Now, I love that because that's true, right? When God says something, it's as good as done. We can take it to the bank. As far as we're we're concerned, it's over, right? It's over. And that's the point. The angel is declaring Babylon is over with. 
The question is, what's Babylon? Right? What is Babylon? Well, in the Bible, Babylon refers to or speaks of the headquarters of Satan. Why? Why? Well, how many of you remember the story in Genesis chapter 11 of a place called the Tower of Babel? You guys remember that? What happened in Babel? Remember, in Babel is the first place where false religion and false idolatry is introduced in the word. Well, guess what? Babel eventually became Babylon. And this place, again, where Satan introduced false religion, again, is where it all started. And so Babylon refers to this false kingdom, this false spiritual kingdom. But during the seven-year tribulation, remember, the Antichrist is going to rule over the world politically and economically, and the false prophet is going to rule over the world spiritually, and their false kingdom is this Babylon, this false Babylon. And so the angel is declaring that their kingdom, their system has fallen because that day will come, right? That their kingdom will come to an end at the end of the tribulation. Look at verse 9. And another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, always pay attention to the details on a side note. I want to call your attention to the fact that the first angel spoke with a loud voice. Second angel didn't. Third angel does. You guys with me? Always important. He says, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength, no decaf, okay, into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast in its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. First angel, let me recap, came proclaiming final warning. Get right with God before it's too late. Second angel came and announces, get right, why? Because the kingdom of the Antichrist is falling. As a matter of fact, it's as good as done. And now the third angel shows up and he speaks in a loud voice again. Why? Because the first angel gave a warning to the people. And now the third angel gives a warning again. And so he's speaking loud to get their attention. And he warns them. If any of you choose to receive the mark, right? On your right hand or your forehead. If any of you choose to bow down and worship the Antichrist or his image. What is going to happen to them is going to happen to you. And that's what this warning is. It is a warning for those that were still on the fence. Those that hadn't received the mark yet. Don't follow the Antichrist because if you do, you're going to follow him all the way to hell. And so don't do it. Don't do it. Don't follow the one. What does he say? I'll read it again. Uh, look back uh, again in verse 8. The one who caused all nations to drink the wine of the passion of sexual immorality. Now, when we look at the world today and we recognize we live in a sinful world, pleasure and passion and, and immorality, can you imagine how, much, how amplified it will be during the time when Satan is ruling? That's what Satan will be doing, again, to draw people in. They can have religion their way. They can live how they want. They can do what they want. Just do it this way. Forget about what the Bible says. You can have God and, and, or what is it, like have your cake and eat it too. And anyone who does that, anyone who drinks in the, the sinful passions, again, that is, that is given through this, this leading of the false prophet, again, is going to pay the penalty. But notice what he says. He talks about those that drink in the cup of sexual immorality. And then here in verse 10, it says, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath. Let me put it this way. You can't have your cake and eat it too. 
Anyone who chooses to drink the cup of sin will also drink the cup of God's wrath. Remember what I said at the beginning. He who dances will one day pay the piper. That's what he says. And when this cup of God's wrath is poured out, what does it say? It will be poured out in full strength. What does that mean? It won't be watered down. It won't be diluted. When God's judgment come, it is coming in full power. Now that's interesting. Why? Because if you've been with us and we've seen all the judgments of God during the tribulation, God could have wiped the world out in his first judgment, right? But what did he do? He mixed his judgment with a little bit of mercy. But now we'll come to the end. And so that judgment that is now coming, there'll be no mercy. It will come at full strength. It will literally wipe out the ungodly world. Remember, very important, simple scripture. For the wages of sin is death. You want to play? Then you will pay. Again, you don't mess with God. Now, the details of what will happen is right here. Look at really quick the details. They will be tormented with fire and sulfur in a place where the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they will never find rest. Now, that's interesting. Why? Because there are many people today, even those that claim to be Christian, that say what? There's no how. Have you guys heard that yet? There's books on it. There was a Christian preacher, I'll put it in quotes, Christian preacher, who had taught about how for years and decided it wasn't real, that God showed him it wasn't real, and now teaches that there is no hell. And there was a movie about it about a year ago. It's all over Hollywood. The world doesn't want to believe there's a hell so that we can sin and live how we want. No consequences. But does the Bible give us details about it? Do you know that Jesus and the disciples or his apostles talked more about hell than they did heaven. Do you guys know that? What does that say? It's real. The details are here. It's a terrible place. A place that God does not want anyone to go. But again, he won't force you to receive his free gift of salvation. Let's move quick. Let's look at the second thing. And the last two are quick. The call for believers to persevere. Verse 12. Here is a call for the endurance, the perseverance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Now, again, we talked about this. There will be many, I believe millions, who will not receive the mark, who are going to try to do everything they can to live for God. And I think about this. I think about the church today, again, And I think about how many people, again, will be left behind. Now, when they are left behind, they're going to know better because they sat in church. They heard the word. Maybe they heard the book of Revelation. And they knew this was going to happen. And they are finally seeing Revelation take place all around them. And they know they cannot receive the mark. But how difficult is it going to be to live for God when the Antichrist is ruling? In case you weren't here, The Bible says that without the mark, you will not be able to eat or buy or sell anything, which means you're not going to be able to get any food. How do you live? And I think about how many will will hold out as long as they can, right? And they'll be starving. Seriously. I mean, we don't even want to imagine that, but you need to imagine it. How difficult it's going to be when everyone is receiving the mark and you don't, you know you can't. What happens if you have kids? What do you do? It is going to be hard to live for God. And then how hard is it when you begin to see Christians being beheaded? Revelation chapter 20 talks about those that were beheaded by the Antichrist. What do you do? Literally, when your life is on the line. I tell you, I'll say it again. If you can't serve God today, I don't know how you think you're going to do it when you turn on the TV and they're chopping Christians' heads off. And so that's why John writes, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. You guys got to hang in there. 
You have to hang in there. Those who keep the commandments of God and faith in Jesus. It is going to be hard. But you don't have no other choice. Do you guys understand they won't have any choice? The only choice is to follow the Antichrist, follow him all the way to hell. And so they're going to have to hang in there. They're going to have to wait out the storm literally. And it is going to be the most difficult time to be on earth, which is why Jesus, again, in Matthew 24, 13, says the one who endures to the end, what? Will be saved. You have no choice. You have to endure, whether it be to the end of your life or the end of the tribulation. You can't give in. You can't bow down. You can't receive the mark. Now, in case you're wondering how difficult life on earth will be during these seven years, look at the next verse. Verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven, many say this is God the Father, saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Holy Spirit, that they may find rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Things are going to be so difficult on planet earth that it will actually be a blessing to die. Can you imagine that? It'll be a blessing because at least if he takes your head off, you find rest. That's what it says. It's going to be so difficult living day by day. You'll finally find rest. John says it again. John writes it. Possibly the Father and the Spirit say it. Not only will you finally find rest, remember, those in hell will never find rest, but your good deeds will follow you. In other words, God will remember what you did for him. The Bible tells us this in Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name. God's going to be watching. Are you going to bow down? You're going to stay strong even if they take your life? Again, it will be a difficult time, but those who chose to get in the hard way, remember I talked about this last time? Today we can get in the easy way, amen? But if you don't want to get in the easy way, if you want to wait and still play around and sin and live how you want, you can. But in order to get to heaven, you'll have to get in the hard way. And that's the hard way, okay? That is the hard way. Let's look at the last thing that we're done this morning. The great reaping of the ungodly, okay? The great reaping of the ungodly. Verse 14, John says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now remember, after the final warning to the unsaved world, the encouragement to those that choose to follow God during the tribulation, Jesus shows up. Isn't that awesome? He's coming back. He's coming back. How do we know it's Jesus? Well, he's on a white cloud. Clouds in the Bible always symbolize the presence of God. Okay? The presence of God. And so Jesus returns. Notice, one like the Son of Man. Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. It is a messianic or title for the Messiah. We see Jesus coming on the cloud, right? He has a golden crown on his head. Why? Because he's coming as a conquering king. But notice in his hand is a sharp sickle. A sharp sickle. Picture the grim reaper. You guys with me? That's the sickle. What was a sickle? A sickle, again, was an instrument... It was a harvesting tool back then with a, a, a wooden stick with a sharp curved blade. And it was used to quickly cut things down. And Jesus comes with this sickle. What happened to the nice, simple Lamb of God, right? People say, oh, Jesus, you know, he's that 110-pound guy, you know, on the cross. No, he's Almighty God, Okay. And you don't mess with him. And he's coming back one day. He's coming back to judge the world. And Jesus spoke about the authority he has given to judge the world. Jesus said in John 5, 26, For as the Father has life in himself, 
so he, the Father, granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he, the Father, has given him authority to execute judgment. Why? Because he is the Son of Man, okay? And so we see again Jesus returning as the Son of Man to execute judgment on the Father's behalf. Also, way back in the book of Daniel, and this is beautiful, Understand that the book of Daniel was written 600 years before Jesus was born in the manger, okay? 600 years, and Daniel was given a vision, and he says in Daniel 7, 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, okay? The fulfillment of scripture, And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall never be destroyed. This was prophesied, the return of the Messiah who would come and finally again establish his kingdom upon the earth, sit upon the throne of David, okay? All in fulfillment of scripture. Let me give you one more. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation... Of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, (coughs) and, uh, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn as they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You guys understand it's all there? In the Old Testament and the New Testament, it was all there. What Jesus is doing has always been predicted. Again, and I'm sharing these scriptures so you understand. It's always been there. In other words, God's always told us this was going to happen. He's always warned us. Let's wrap it up. Verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. You know, in the Greek, the word fully ripe actually means overripe. In other words, it's, it's ready. It's past time. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. The earth was reaped. Verse 17, then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Now get this, Jesus prophesied in Matthew 13, 40. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age, the Son of Man will send out his angels, what we just read, all things that offend, I'm sorry, uh, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's what we read here. Jesus, again, sending out this angel who too had a sharp sickle. Verse 18, and another angel came from the altar. Now, what's the altar? Let me just, this is important. If you've been with us, we have talked about the altar of incense. And I shared with you that in the tabernacle and temple, there would be an altar of incense where (coughs) incense was offered on the fire and the smoke that ascended went up to God. It was a pleasing aroma to God. And biblically, the smoke that ascended is a symbolic picture of our prayers ascending up to God. That's important. Why? Well... If you were with us when we covered Revelation 6 and, cha- and Revelation 8, we read that there were souls under the altar of incense in heaven. You guys remember? Who were they? The Bible says they were the souls of all the people that were martyred by the Antichrist during the tribulation. Why were they at the base of the altar of incense? Because they were praying and they were asking God, remember this, Revelation 6, how long, O Lord, until you're going to deal with the Antichrist? When are you going to deal with those that are on earth who killed us? And God, what? 
gave them a white robe, symbolizing their righteousness. They made it into heaven, but told them to wait a little longer because more still needed to die. Remember that? Well, now we see the answer to their prayer. We see again the angel step forward coming from the altar the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, the other angel, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. Verse 19, so he swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the winepress of the wrath of God, and the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood, this is the blood of the ungodly, flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 miles. Now what this last two verses are describing is a preview. Because in chapter 16, we're going to read about the battle of Armageddon. And that's what it's describing. That's the end of the tribulation. When Jesus returns, all the nations of the world gather together to wage war against him those that are left alive. And Jesus is going to completely slaughter them. And this slaughter is going to be so bad, we would call it a bloodbath today, that blood is going to flow for 1,600 stadia. That calculates to 184 miles. Okay, That's the battlefield. That's the slaughter. But also notice the blood will be as high as a horse's bridle. How high is a horse's bridle? Think about the the bridle on the horse's mouth. It's about three to three and a half, four feet. That's the amount of blood. That's again the goriness of what will happen to those who refuse to worship God and stand against him. How scary that is, huh? How scary that is. What's the bottom line? Jesus wins. Right? Real simple. Let's just sum it all up. Jesus wins. But in order to make sure you're on the winning side, don't wait. Right? Get on his side today. Join the winning side. That should be a banner somewhere. Join the winning side today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, guys. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, this morning again for your word, Lord. Scary. But we thank you, Lord, that you have warned us. You've told us. There's no excuses. We know. Give us wisdom. It begins with fearing you. That we would follow you. That we would live for you. That we would do all that we can to tell those that we love, Lord God, to do the same. To be ready. One, so that we skip the tribulation. But more importantly, Lord, that we live lives today that bring you glory. You deserve that. You alone are worthy. We thank you, Lord, for your word always. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand, guys. Let's stand. Let's stand. We take a break from Revelation next week, of course, for it being uh, Easter Sunday, but we will resume chapter 15 the following weekend. So again, going right through the whole book. If you missed any of it, guys, it's available on YouTube. You can go back and listen to the details of any of this stuff you're interested. I know a lot of people are fascinated uh, by the book of Revelation, and so that's available to you. As we close this morning, as we close, I thank God that he's a God of second chances, right? He's awesome. Thank you, God. Thank you that that you're that good. But let me ask you this one question. How many chances does he need to give you? How many chances does he need to give you until you finally obey him? I wonder how many people come to church on a weekly basis, not just this church, but churches across the world. And God's word is delivered. And the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and makes it alive in their heart and the Holy Spirit deals with them and they know God's dealing with them. God's dealing with them and calling on them, challenging them to repent, reminding them that there is nothing on this world, on this earth, going through the tribulation for, going to hell for, nothing. There's nothing. So what are we waiting for? I pray again, you would not wait any longer. If that's you and you've been waiting for whatever, what are you waiting for? get right with God today. Know that you can have the peace that this world can't find. 
And all you got to do again, it's not about joining a church. It's not about giving money. It's about none of those things. The price has been paid. It is free. Thank you, Jesus, right? But it's about coming to God, acknowledging you're a sinner and need of his forgiveness, acknowledging that he died for you, not just the world. He died for you on that cross, thanking him for doing that. And as he gave his life for you again, give your life to him. If you need to do that this morning, we have the prayer team. They're here on both sides. Again, it doesn't matter if you're a guest. Again, if it's your first time, if that's you, you know the Lord's speaking to you, then get right with him. Get right with him. Understand, God brought you here for a reason. And so again, respond to God's goodness. Respond to his love and his mercy. Don't put it off any longer. We'll sing a closing song. But if you need prayer for that or anything else, guys, you're welcome to come to the front.